Welcome to the Indo-Pakistan uh, nuclear war simulation briefing. This is a sort of a, a model United Nations mixed in with an operational component uh, with a heavy emphasis on uh, balance of power uh, interaction. Um, I think there are emergent properties that occur in a simulation when you account for the cross-cutting cleavages between the interests of different countries. And out of that complexity, you get a lot of... Um, uh, a, lot, a lot of opportunities for compromise, and it also uh, goes a significant way to explain why in certain situations the equilibrium of the status quo is, is so solid and why war uh, is unlikely. And typically uh, in simulations where conflict does break out, you then see the countervailing uh, forces that compel states uh, to make peace, which includes things like third-party threats and the disruption of the international commercial systems uh, to other members of the international uh, community. So in this simulation, there are different positions that are assigned. Uh, uh, countries have multiple players, and an important aspect of the country is to divide the model UN uh, diplomatic uh, component, uh, the domestic decision-making component, and the operational military component. And to that end, the foreign minister and the political leader of any country may not see the battle map where the military person is. The leader of a country may only confer with the members of their armed forces and their foreign minister. And uh, only the foreign ministers of countries can speak to other foreign ministers of other countries. So you have, in effect, uh, channeled communications that uh, replicate the specialization of the different offices, as well uh, as uh, showing the uh, significant limitation of information that the executive has, but at the same time, they have to weave together and balance the military and the diplomatic uh, methods, which are often uh, contradictory to achieve a particular, uh, particular end. So you can see here all the different players that I think would matter in a nuclear exchange uh, in South Asia and the different positions. Some like Japan and Saudi Arabia uh, have only a political leader who is also the foreign minister and the military leader. And um, you have the same situation for the Russians and the European Union who are abbreviated to two. So in that case, the political leader is also the foreign minister. This is the map, sort of an overview. Uh, the parts that are important are the uh, the areas uh, consisting of Pakistan, India, and uh, the contiguous parts of China. This is uh, zooming into the Sindh and uh, uh, Gujarat in India. The different types of terrain are blue for ocean. If the ocean has uh, orange edges on the hex side, it's a channel for oil exports from the Persian Gulf. Yellow is desert. Green is built up, essentially representing the agricultural terrain with a lot of uh, canals that impedes movement. Uh, blue hexides are rivers. Pink hexides uh, are uh, either international or provincial borders. So in Pakistan, the four provinces are divided up with a pink border, and uh, the pink border also divides India from Pakistan. The red lines are road networks. Units may only move from one hex to another, moving along those red lines. This is important. Uh, they represent channels of movement. So the essential mechanic of the game is sort of a shoving match along these uh, avenues. The uh, black dots are cities, and some of them are named, although the map is quite old, so the, the, the ink has started to fade in. Asterixes, which accompany black dots, are areas where there are nuclear facilities, uh, civilian nuclear facilities that are exposed. The um, brown triangles are hills, uh, as well as the, the, uh, not the, not the triangles, rather, the, the inverted Vs uh, in both Afghanistan um, and in China and in uh, uh, Pakistan and the Himalayas of India. So these are the different terrain types. Uh, individual counters, uh, which are the pieces that represent the military units, have uh, uh, four values representing four capabilities. AA means the value used against aircraft. G indicates values used against ground targets. ASM is anti-ship missiles or values used against ships. And ASW is anti-submarine warfare or values used against submarines. A value, in theory, can be nothing. 
uh, all the way up to 9. And in this simulation, we use a randomized value uh, of uh, 1 to 10. And typically, I use a, um, a random function on a calculator, but a 10-sided dice, a 10-sided die is also uh, good. Uh, essentially, you have to roll equal to or less than the value. And sometimes there are modifiers that reduce or increase the value further. And if you do, then you inflict an effect on the target. And depending on the target, it could be to destroy the target, to flip the target over to its weaker uh, step loss side, or to push the target back. Or to destroy, uh, you could destroy a target on the ground, which is uh, depicted on the map like the nuclear facilities. So these are the different units. You can see that they're uh, color-coded. You've got India, Pakistan, China, US, and Saudi, uh, which are depicted on the left side. These are the pieces that are initially set up. And then you've got the reinforcements on the right side, and the numbers indicate what turns they come in. There are mushroom clouds uh, to the far right. In the center, you have orange markers that indicate which countries have suffered their an oil cutoff in the Persian Gulf. At the bottom left, you can see uh, the different indicators of the symbols, fleet and aircraft carriers and submarines for uh, the maritime element. And you've got Marines, Airborne, Army Corps, Armored Units, Rockets. You've also got sea mines, which can be deployed on the map. And you can see the four values uh, for these different units. For some of the missile units, it'll indicate at the bottom of the, of the counter the range in hexes that the missile unit can launch uh, its, its, uh, its system. So these are the essential values, uh, and you can match up the symbol in the center of the counter to figure out what the, what the precise function of the unit is. And you can see the units, again, they're color-coded, and some are tricky, like Japan and the European Union, uh, Russia, which is pink, you have to recall, and Saudi Arabia, which is half yellow, half green, you have to associate with that particular uh, state. But these are all the pieces that are used in the game, so it's quite a simple uh, game. The OOB on the top means order of battle. So, this is um, the orange uh, um, sea line of communication that comes from the Persian Gulf, where the oil is. And it's not very easy to see, but along the length of it are the names of countries written in red. And if ever a mine is placed uh, in the sea line of communications, uh, closer to the origin of the Persian Gulf, closer to the origin of the Straits of Hormuz, then all countries uh, past that, uh, are without oil, and those orange markers will be deployed to indicate that there is no more oil for that country, and that country suffers a minus one in combat for its air and ground units in the subsequent turn. Um, each turn is in this uh, simulation is approximately one week, and uh, each hex is approximately uh, 75 uh, kilometers, just to give sort of a, 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 rough, a rough scale to the simulation. So here you can see... Um, uh, not a mine being deployed, but a Pakistani surface flotilla being deployed along the sea line of communications. And because India is downstream, and because ships are a lot more discriminate than mines, Pakistan can then choose which country uh, has its tankers blocked, and in this case it's India. So India will have the minus modifier. Until uh, anyone, any other nation comes along and removes Pakistan's uh, flotilla, or Pakistan removes it voluntarily, that uh, blockage of oil will uh, persist. Uh, here you can see mines laid, and here it's near the very edge of the map, uh, four hexes away from the edge of the map, and because the EU and the USA are uh, beyond the mine marker, uh, they, have, they suffer a no oil uh, penalty. So this is the uh, setup. Uh, essentially, the uh, Indians set up first, followed by Pakistan. They set up their respective ground units, air units, and sea units. The sea units are set up uh, respectively in Karachi and uh, Mumbai. The air units can be set up no more than one per city. So each city represents a network of air bases and airfields located in and around uh, the urban area. Uh, then you've got China uh, as well that has to be set up. Then the U.S. puts its, uh, um, uh, its two aircraft somewhere in the GCC. That means Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates or Oman uh, or Qatar, the U.S. chooses. And then there are the, the Saudis that have to deploy their units in Dahran in the Persian Gulf. Now, India deploys its army units first, and then Pakistan follows. Um, and th this is what's important. There are more road networks than there are units, and India has to divide its units between the Himalayan border with China 
and with Pakistan. Pakistan's got fewer forces, uh, but it's also got uh, less to defend. But in both cases, India and China will be faced with an inadequate amount of ground forces to cover all of their infrastructure. So difficult choices will have to be made. And you can see here the, the numbers indicate which type of a particular unit, because um, there is more than one kind of, of uh, aircraft unit, for example, in the Pakistan Air Force or the Indian Air Force. This is the consolidated reinforcement chart. Um, every turn, these pieces arrive. Um, you can see in turn two, uh, India, China, and Russia have units that are deployed. Uh, in the rules, it specifies how the units are deployed. For example, if, if you're looking at the European Union or Russian or American uh, aircraft, they can be deployed anywhere they are invited. Uh, Chinese aircraft can be invited into Pakistan. Uh, American aircraft can be invited into both India and Pakistan although it, it almost never happens. Um, Russians, uh, Russians may deploy their uh, airborne unit on a particular location, as can the Americans, their airborne unit. All ships are put anywhere on the um, blue part of the, of the map, uh, the Arabian Sea or the Persian Gulf, and uh, they have un basically unlimited movement. This is the uh, aircraft range chart, which is important for uh, keeping track of for, for the tactical combat. Uh, most of the air forces have a range of five hexes, which means from the city where they're based, they can fly out to five hexes to hit a ground unit. They can fly out 10 hexes to hit ships and 15 hexes to hit subs if they have the capacity to attack the sub. Uh, and this represents different kinds of aircraft. Maritime surveillance aircraft have longer ranges. Uh, nuclear um, weapons drop from aircraft give the aircraft a 20 hex range if they're launched from India and Pakistan and a 10 hex range um, if they're launched from China. And for China, it basically represents the Q5 uh, Fantan uh, missile, where for Pakistan, it's the uh, F-16 and for India, it's the Mirage. Uh, the Americans, the Russians, European Union, and Japan have in-flight refueling. Their aircraft have unlimited range. Although curiously, Japan has no airplanes in this particular uh, sim. Uh, U.S. carriers have a 20 hex range. Uh, and once they've lost, uh, once they've suffered one step loss in combat, they, they no longer have that 20 hex range. Essentially, the carrier's been stripped of aircraft, and all they have is the surface action group. Um, and here's some uh, sort of additional uh, values that we'll talk about later. Uh, so this is a, a, a very quick ground combat in the Himalayas. You've got China to the top uh, right, and the bottom left is uh, India. Aircraft are based at cities. Ground units are based at... Um, uh, along red red lines, which are the infrastructure, and it, the game is basically a, a shoving match. So the uh, game starts with uh, India going first, and India's got uh, an infantry, infantry unit, an armored unit, then an infantry unit. Um, the infantry units have a value of zero, uh, 1, zero, 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 going clockwise from the 1 value. The 1 represents their ability to shoot at aircraft, so if an aircraft is put over an Indian unit, they can roll to try to stop the aircraft from attacking. And so, the, the, very briefly, the way the combat here works, and we'll, we'll get into the more details in, in a moment, is uh, the Indian player wants to push the Chinese soldiers back, and they want to be able to move into China. So, what they've done with the top leftmost unit is that unit's moved into China, because there's no opposing Chinese unit. The, uh, ch the other two Chinese units are going to be uh, attacked uh, by um, the... Uh, Indian unit, the armored unit. Uh, the infantry units, that's the units with the big X in the middle, are, are essentially cores of about 50,000 soldiers. They have very lim limited um, offensive capability unless there's no unit opposing them, so they can advance against no opposition, but uh, and they can move one hex per turn. All ground units can move one hex per turn unless they're airborne. They can just be dropped on the map uh, wherever, and then they begin their one hex per turn movement. Now, what the Indian player has done is taken his two aircraft, flown five hexes, now, I've made an error with one of them. The Indian aircraft on the extreme right could not have gone that far, but let's just pretend it can do six hexes. And so those aircraft then engage in combat, and they engage in combat using the values, which are the um, air-to-air -air attack values, which are the bottom left, which you can see on the left side is three for the Chinese unit, three for the Indian unit. unit. So you would take a, a calculator and randomly generate a number, and if it's three or less, then they inflict a step loss on the aircraft, the opponent, and then they flip the aircraft over. So that, that combat was resolved. In addition, the Indian armored unit, the one with the sort of circle or the oval in the box, um, has to roll 
uh, less than the attack value of three, which is the top left number for a ground attack. From that, we do some uh, modifications. If the combat is occurring uh, into a hex where the defender's in the mountains, and in this case it's hard to see, but the Chinese are, are in the mountains, there's a minus two modifier, so that three becomes a one. If the unit's attacking across a river, it's an additional uh, minus two. Rivers are very large in South Asia, and so it'd be a total of minus four. And if, if it's attacking uh, into a defender's hex with a city on it, a black dot, then it's another minus one. So those, those are the three maximalist um, values that can modify it. Now, a value of one is always a success in the attack, and rolling a 10 is always a failure, regardless. So in this particular instance, the uh, Indians would have to roll a one um, with the armored unit to be able to push uh, into uh, China. So here we have the result of the combat. Uh, in this, if you look at the Chinese, Chinese uh, aircraft unit on the extreme right, it's been uh, flipped over to its weaker side. Um, the Indian player did manage to roll a one with his armored unit, and so he pushed the uh, Chinese unit down that red road. Now, if ever that Chinese unit gets to the edge of the map or is forced to retreat uh, at a dead end in a red road, it's destroyed. Now, uh, the Chinese unit could have chosen to take losses instead. In other words, it, it would not have retreated and it would have been flipped over to its weaker side on the other side. But of course, if, 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 it's ever, um, if it ever chooses not to retreat again and is flipped over again, the unit is annihilated. And the, the units, when they, when they die in this game, they, they do not come back. So at the end of the turn, the, the Indian units have flown uh, back home. So now it's the uh, Chinese player's turn, and with the Chinese player, is a different approach. What he's going to do is apply the aircraft uh, to support ground attacks. So uh, he, the Chinese player's got two armored units. They can attack offensively, unlike the, um, unlike the ground units. And so um, you can have a maximum of one attacking aircraft supporting a ground attack per ground unit attacking. And when you attack a hex, you have to attack all the different units in the hex um, separately. Now, you can only ever have one infantry unit in a hex, but you can have an unlimited number of other types of units in a hex. Because those, those infantry units are huge organizations that, that occupy the entire space of that hex. So what we would do is, is uh, first of all, resolve the ground-to-air combat. Um, because those Chinese aircraft are attacking ground units that are shooting up in the sky, and so we look at the number, which is the bottom left, and you, the Indian player would roll less than or equal to that number, which is three for the armored unit and one or less for the infantry unit, and if they did, those Chinese units would be uh, uh, chased off, and they would simply land back where they came from. No damage to the air units. If they survive, they add the value of their ground value to the Chinese uh, attack value. So let's take a look at the middle attack. You've got a four attack value of a Chinese armored unit. You've got three attack from the Chinese air unit for a total of seven, but they're attacking into a mountain, which is a minus two for a total of five. So they'd have to roll a five or less to push back the uh, Indian unit. So let's see what happens. Uh, so uh, in, in fact, there was success. The um, Chinese unit on the right pushed across the border and was able to uh, uh, push the Indian unit across the border. Both Indian units failed in their surf to air attacks. Um, and in, in the uh, uh, farthest um, north Chinese piece, uh, it attacked the Indian unit, causing it to retreat. But the Indian player chose not to retreat and instead flipped the unit over uh, to its weaker side. And you can see the weaker numbers on that other side. So this is sort of a sample uh, ground combat. Let's take a look at naval combat. You've got Pakistani units to the left, uh, Indian units to the right, and at the bottom of the map you have a blue uh, on white uh, Indian aircraft carrier and you've got two aircraft um, uh, that are deployed in cities along the coast uh, in India. This is somewhere somewhere south of Gujarat. So the, Indi the Pakistanis in this instance move first. Uh, you can move a naval surface craft adjacent to each other or next to each other, but submarines can go underneath uh, oppo opposing ships. So the Pakistanis have moved their submarine um, in the, into the same hex as the Indian surface ship and the Indian uh, submarine and then they conduct their attack. And the result of the attack is the Indian surface ship is damaged by the Pakistani surface ship. The Indian surface ship fires back. So notice that in, in um, air to air and ship to ship, sub to sub, and sub to ship, and ship to air, and air to ship, all the combat is simultaneous. And both, both parties to the combat uh, attempt to resolve combat. But in ground combat, only the attacker attacks. The defender does not make any rolls. So in this, is, in this is instance, the uh, Indian surface ship attacks the submarine. It inflicts a loss. So the Pakistani submarine is damaged. 
the Indian surface ship is damaged by the uh, Pakistani surface ship. The Indian submarine is damaged by the Pakistani submarine. And this ends the uh, Pakistani turn. In the uh, Indian player's turn, the aircraft carrier can participate. So there are um, uh, different ranges for aircraft carriers. And the Pakistani player could have attacked the Indian aircraft carrier. But the, the advantage of the aircraft carrier is they can attack a target and they, they cannot be attacked in turn because they're too far away. So in this instance, uh, this aircraft carrier um, is going to attack both the submarine and the ship, which it does. So it's got a value of four ag against the uh, ship and three against the submarine. The uh, Indian submarine attacks the Pakistani submarine. The Indian surface ship attacks the Pakistani surface ship. And India deploys two aircraft, which have uh, a one value for anti-ship attacks against the uh, Pakistani ship. And the net result is the submarine is sunk. Um, and the surface ship is damaged. And so the combat is, is uh, simultaneous, so it doesn't matter which party goes first, but everyone has to roll that value or less uh, on, in, the, uh, in the actual combat. So this is the rule for the uh, nuclear weapons. Um, the Americans have unlimited nuclear warheads, but they may not do counter-value targeting. In other words, they cannot blow up cities and, and deliberately target civilians. The ranges for their um, uh, aircraft that have a, a ground value of 4 and plus. Um, well, sorry, any, any aircraft with a ground attack value of 4 or plus can drop nuclear weapons, and, and American aircraft have an unlimited range, so there's no range on the aircraft, no, lim no range limits. The submarine ship aircraft carriers can each fire an unlimited number of nuclear weapons, 20 hexes, and armored marine and airborne units can fire uh, within two hexes. Those are obviously tactical uh, nuclear weapons. It's, it seems peculiar that the Americans can fire un unlimited nuclear weapons. They can just blanket the entire map. But one of the key um, uh, penalties is for every nuclear weapon detonated, the U.S., the European Union, and Japan suffer a penalty uh, because of the effect it has on the world economy, severely constraining American hegemony, undermining commercial confidence, and, and probably uh, inducing uh, an economic contraction. So... It, there, there's a nuclear weapons should be used sparingly, even if operationally they're very effective. Russia has unlimited warheads. They can blow up cities if they want. They have a 20 hex range for aircraft, ships, and a 5 hex range for their airborne unit because the Russians have much better theater missiles than the uh, U.S. So the India political player, as opposed to the India military player, have different kinds of nuclear weapons. The India Indian player can fire uh, missiles against cities and against uh, aircraft at cities in Pakistan, China, and Saudi Arabia. Um, but their nuclear weapons are, are not uh, operationally uh, very um, uh, uh, easy to deploy, um, and so they're, they're really just counter-value target. You can blow up cities with these things. So um, there's the 7 hex range for the Arahant, which has got three nuclear weapons. The Agni IRBM has unlimited range, um, and... Uh, uh, India's got five aircraft with an anti-ground attack minimum of three to four, and they've got a 20 hex range. Um, and the Indian military, with permission of the political leader, has a 10, 10 Prithvi rockets, uh, which have a two hex range. The units themselves can move three hex per turn, and they can target land, air, and uh, city units. Pakistan's got five nukes uh, in the uh, 25 hex range HATF, and they can target cities and aircraft uh at cities in India, and the military has a shorter range, range hafts, and it's got 10 nuclear weapons that are droppable by the aircraft 2422, which is an F-16. It's got 20 hex range. Uh, China's political um, authority has got 10 DF-21 missiles with a range of uh, 18 hexes, and uh, they've got 10 nuclear weapons that can be dropped by aircraft. So we're not talking about a huge number of nuclear weapons in the parties, and that's the issue of South Asia, is you can kill a lot of people and destroy a lot of cities, but the political effect is in question because the total number of uh, nuclear warheads are, are in at most the hundreds. So uh, you're looking at a very powerful instrument, which is nonetheless uh, limited by the vast expanse of the two countries, and that has a different political effect than, say, the uh, Cold War. Here you can see a Pakistani hat um, uh, with a 25 hex range uh, being deployed in Balochistan, and uh, over three turns it can drop three nuclear weapons over different uh, on different cities in India. And this is, uh, um, uh, for example, Mumbai here getting hit. So let's get into some of the more um, uh, detailed uh, rules. Uh, actually, no. Before before we do that, we'll look at the. Uh, this is an Ed memoir. This is what I use to keep track of the uh, the different expenditures of nuclear weapons, and sort of a Ed memoir for me for the rules regarding uh, aircraft ranges. 
Now, the core of the game is the diplomatic component. Each of the positions has a card, and the card tells, uh, puts the restrictions on the players, and it shows them what they can and cannot do, what they control. And at the bottom of each card are things they do that get points, victory point bonuses, and the penalties. And you can see here, obviously, the uh, political player uh, would like uh, Pakistan to give restitution for, the, for some sort of incident that occurred in Mumbai that started the, the war the game starts in which Pakistan and India are in a state of war. Um, you've got uh, victory points for conquest of different areas and different cities, uh, victory points for a disarmament agreement, and you've got penalties for losses of cities or destruction of cities and for a Kashmir settlement or a, a plebiscite. Um, depending on, on uh, how I've decided to structure the game, sometimes the political player will also be penalized for excessive losses incurred by the India military player. So here's the Indian foreign minister. They've got uh, victory point bonuses and penalties they get for uh, receiving foreign aid, for example, and military help or having oil embargoes put on them by other players. So this is the foreign minister's job is to maximize their points in this area. And this is the India military player. It lists the victory point bonuses and the victory point penalties, as well as where their forces are deployed. This is a reproduction of the setup part of the, of the, of the rules and uh, the reinforcements they're going to get on on a particular turn. This is, a, uh, again, this is a China political. There's also a China military and a China foreign minister, which I have not shown. But you can see the more detailed punishment instruments at the bottom, where China can have influences on other parties, such as the Americans, the Saudis, Japan, the European Union, by doing things like putting pressure on Taiwan or, or goading uh, North Korea to distract the Americans. Um, yeah, here's Saudi Arabia political. Um, so I'm not going to show you all the cards, I'm just showing you some of the cards. Here you can see the foreign aid totals at the bottom that Saudi Arabia can offer. And again, punishment instruments for Saudi Arabia is mostly uh, withholding of oil exports. Um, so all the different players, all the positions each have their own card, and players you know, are strongly recommended to look at the cards, see what they have to do, and then consult other players to see how their interests interact or um, uh, compete with the interests of other players. Uh, here's a list of uh, international agreements. You've got uh, United Nations Security Council. They can propose a ceasefire, and there's penalties for breaking it. Uh, you can, uh, uh, United Nations Security Council can create a formal condemnation if the Americans, the Chinese, European Union, and Russia agree. Uh, India and Pakistan can agree to a Kashmir settlement or a Kashmir uh, plebiscite uh, or a conventional disarmament agreement or even a ceasefire agreement. So it's sort of complicated uh, choices here. This is ultimately how I determine the players. I have a sort of a Monte Carlo um, where I repeat, uh, rather I, I record repeated plays of the game. I work out the average uh, point scored and then I work out the deviation um, uh, for a given game from that score and then I, I compare the values between countries. So students are not playing against other countries. Students are playing against other players of the same country in previous plays of the game. Now, I know uh, probably a more appropriate way of determining a winner in this game is to uh, take the, the standard deviation above or below the mean um, from the distribution of values and then use that to compare between different players. But that's, uh, that's a, a future project I'm going to do um, uh, when I got more time. So let's go back and uh, review some of the more detailed rules for uh, combat. Um, sort of going through the, uh, the rules here, let's go back here to the... Uh, border with um, India and China. Um, so the uh, just a couple of uh, minor rules. The uh, Russian airborne and air units can be placed in any Indian city. And uh, once the, uh, the airborne units uh, deployed, like the American airborne unit, it can move one hex uh, per turn. Um, the uh, U.S. Marines and Armored Corps enter accompanied by a sea unit or an aircraft carrier unit that, that should be American. Um, and then it, it's deployed uh, at a city on a coast, and then it moves uh, normally like uh, any other uh, unit. Units may be pulled off the map, um, but uh, uh, they cannot return thereafter. And you would do that if you want to save a unit from being uh, completely destroyed, uh, for example, and, and losing victory points for it. Um, essentially, you have two camps. The first camp is India and Russia, and uh, they're supposed to move uh, very quickly. They have about a minute to move all their pieces, because there's not a lot of pieces. And then uh, combat's resolved, and then Pakistan moves with its camp, um, uh, Pakistan, China, Saudi Arabia. The U.S., European Union, and Japan typically join one of the other camps, but they, they play as a third party, essentially, until they commit to one of the two camps. 
Saudi Arabia and China and Russia can switch camps if they want, but it, it's sort of atypical because of the way that uh, the points um, are resolved. Now, um, uh, essentially, uh, infantry units, uh, you can have a maximum of one of those per hex, but you can have an unlimited number of armored units deployed um, with on top of those infantry units, or, and you can have unlimited number of armored units stacked together. So those are really, the armored units are your offensive units. Now the problem with the armored units is aircraft um, uh, can never cause a step loss on a ground infantry unit. A ground infantry unit has to basically voluntarily lose a step um, and, and when it's being pushed back, um, and, or rather, and it chooses not to retreat. Or it could be it could lose a step from having a, a nuclear weapon dropped on on top of it. Um, but armored units can be destroyed from the air uh, and with nuclear weapons, and so uh, because they're more exposed, they're less dug in, um, they're less extensive. There's less less uh, less content to them to, than the vast infantry uh, core type uh, organizations, so they can be destroyed. Um, so uh, the we talked before about the combat terrain effects, which is minus one if the air if the target is in a town, minus two if there are mountains, minus two across the river. Um, uh, there's also a plus one um, modifier uh, if an aircraft is attacking a target in a desert, which is indicated by the by a yellow hex, um, and a minus one if an aircraft is attacking a ground unit located in a city or a mountain. Um, uh, which in effect is 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 the the ground units getting cover by being hidden there. Whenever ships are operating on, in the coast, and they're being attacked by an aircraft, uh, the aircraft gets a plus one because ships operating next to coasts are vulnerable to other effects like being hit by um, um, a coastal defense uh, type of craft. Um, uh, so I'm just going through the uh, so nuclear missiles. Um, nuclear missile units themselves can move uh, three hexes per turn. They can never be destroyed uh, from the air, even with nuclear weapons. However, uh, if ever they're alone in a hex and a unit moves on top of them, uh, they're uh, destroyed. Uh, if they're stacked with another friendly unit and that friendly unit retreats, they can retreat uh, with that uh, friendly unit as well. So they're, they're very vulnerable um, if they're close to ground combat units. So you want to keep track of where they are and keep them away from the front line. But uh, they're effectively invulnerable if they're uh, to the rear. Now the Indian aircraft carrier unit has a range of five hexes and the aircraft carrier unit has a range of 20 hexes. And uh, so if the if the uh, Americans and Indians use their aircraft carrier, then um, th there's no response fire from the from the country that they're that they're attacking. Um, so nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear states can use nuclear weapons at any time once they have uh, permission of the political authority. Um, the Americans cannot, of course, use nuclear weapons against uh, cities. In this particular simulation, delivery is assumed to be automatic. You don't have to roll to see if the nuclear warhead works. We assume that they all uh, function uh, perfectly. Um, there's one exception to a ground unit. Um, whenever, a, whenever a C unit is struck by a, a nuclear weapon, it loses a step, and if, it, if it's already at a half-step strength, it, it's uh, destroyed. Nuclear weapons, of course, can be used to blow up a city uh, for victory points, uh, gains, and losses. Now, Chinese armored units um, are treated as non-armored units for the purposes of nuclear attacks once reduced to their last step. So Chinese armored units cannot be annihilated by nuclear attacks. And infantry units, when they're hit by nuclear attacks, they can be weakened to their um, half-step side, but they cannot be taken off the map. I mean, it would take a, an awful lot of tactical nuclear weapons to wipe out 50,000 dug-in troops dispersed over... Uh, a 75 kilometer front. Uh, so in the, on the scale of the nuclear weapons of this game, it's simply not possible. Um, aircraft that deliver nuclear weapons cannot do anything else uh, except deliver the nuclear weapon, but they may engage in air-to-air -air combat if they're uh, intercepted. And um, their delivery is assumed to be you know, effectively automatic if they survive the, uh, the combat. There may be a maximum of one nuclear attack per target in a hex, per hex, per turn, per state. Okay, so you can't just keep blasting away at one unit uh, in the same turn. Um, the Agni uh, missile has an unlimited uh, rate of fire, but other Indian, uh, Chinese, and Pakistani systems uh, do not. Now, there's a number of uh, nuclear facilities on the map, 
And, um, uh, for example, Pakistan's got Islamabad, uh, Kushab, Sargoda, and Karachi. And India's got Mumbai, Jamnagar, Bilwara, and Meerut. And victory points are awarded. There's a plus four modifier, which makes it easier to blow these targets up because they're mostly civilian or surface military uh, facilities that are easily destroyed. The Americans or the Russians at any point can choose to use nuclear torpedoes, which gives their submarines a plus two modifier when they're attacking other uh, surface ships or submarines. Um, whenever any embargo or foreign aid is provided, it must be done in writing and it must be given to the professor. And once it's given, it's locked in. But they may be conditional. You could say uh, uh, Japan provides not the full amount of foreign aid, but let's say a third of their foreign aid. Uh, let's say they have 10 points and they give three if uh, India ceases to blockade oil from Saudi Arabia, something like that. Um, so the uh, oil embargo leads to a minus one uh, penalty to combat, um, uh, and it only affects the attack. It doesn't affect the uh, turn in which the, the country is defending. Uh, to lay mines, you need one ship per turn to la lay one level of mines, or one ship uh, in the hex to remove one layer of mines. You can have maximum five layers of mines, and as long as a mine is there, it's indiscriminate. Everybody uh, down uh, stream of the sea line of communications does not get any oil. Uh, once all of Pakistan's hexes in the Punjab and the Sindh are occupied uh, by Indian units, and, and the two provinces are indicated by pink porters, then Pakistan surrenders. All their pieces are removed. Um, there's a, a particular governance rule. Uh, uh, the Pakistan military may hold a coup and displace the political player if they get written permission of either the Chinese or the Saudi uh, foreign minister. So this is the one instance in which the military leader of a country, Pakistan's military, can talk directly with the foreign minister of another country. So this is the uh, simulation. There are a couple of other uh, minor rules, um, but the core of the uh, simulation is in the player cards, and so those would have to be, um, uh, the player would have to be very familiar with them in order to uh, maximize their victory points.